To get things started for our session, we're going to have Josh Weed give a presentation. Um, he has been teaching in psychology, both online and face-to-face, uh, -face, and um, Kathy Jackson is going to join him. Kathy's with the Schreier's Institute, and we are very, very happy to have these two um, wonderful folks with us here today. Can't wait to um, continue the conversation with you guys. Thanks a lot. Well, I'm not going to be up here rapping. <laughs> and I didn't realize we were going to have to follow such uh, enthusiastic individuals. But um, I am excited, though, to be here. It's a little bit different than you know, what I usually do in the classroom um, in terms of giving talks. You guys actually care about learning. <laughs> At least I hope. Now, it's not to say that students don't care about learning. But you know, as Steph said, I'm Josh Weedy. I'm a uh, faculty member in the psychology department. And I've got a lot of experience teaching online, um, some experience working with instructional designers. And you know, one of the questions that I wanted to ask you, how many of you have to work with faculty? I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I mean, really, I'm sorry. I mean, it, it, and especially because, you know, a lot of faculty have expertise in their content area, okay? But what you have to do is you have to take that expertise they have, all right, and translate it into a medium that's conducive to learning. And I'm sure you probably get a lot of pushback from faculty at times, you know, because they're experts in their field. They think they're experts at everything, all right? Including the learning process. Now, I'm in a kind of unique situation that, you know, I'm trained as a cognitive psychologist. I know about memory and how it works, okay? When I was designing a course last summer, working with an instructional designer, I see him here, all right? I was fighting him on all kinds of things, all right? And he was right. I mean, the, the, the recommendations that he made, they were spot on. And this is one of the things we hope that you can get away from today's talk. Um, we're going to look at some of the aspects of cognitive psychology and hopefully give you some questions that you can use to kind of probe faculty to think about the design process. All right. Now, I don't know, Kathy, you want to add anything? All right. <laughs> I guess I should just say I'm Kathy and <laughs> should um, I'm, My current job, I'm actually a faculty developer, but I've been an instructional designer for a long time. In fact, so long I brought to show you, it's getting a little embarrassing, my first textbook in instructional design, $4.25. So, um, yeah, boy. And also another trick of the trade, in case you haven't seen this little way cool flip chart of Bloom's taxonomy. So um, anyway, all I bring to this picture is the perspective of an instructional designer. And so when Josh and I were originally asked to do this, we were asked to do separate talks. But then we realized there was so much overlap, it would be more fun. Not fun like your type of fun, <laughs> but fun if we combined and sort of looked at this from the um, you know, perspective of how you would use this information. I must say, Josh is uh, pretty easy to work with compared to some faculty, although I will not say any names. <laughs> yeah, and so that's the way the talk is kind of designed, is I'll talk a little bit about theory, she'll talk a little bit about practice, and hopefully you can walk away with some things that you can use. Now, we wanted to start off, some of you may have seen this before, about the importance of paying attention, all right? Now, I see many of you have their laptops open, I see some of you typing, all right? Now, in the classroom, I would call you out, and I would ask, you know, what you're doing, and do you have anything to add? I'm not going to do that today, but I just want to show the importance of focusing your attention on the task at hand. All right? And I'll just watch this little clip. Some of you have probably seen this before or something similar. The monkey business illusion. Count how many times the players wearing white pass the ball.
correct answer is 16 passes. Did you spot the gorilla? So how many of you saw the gorilla? How many didn't see the gorilla? How many of you have seen a, this video before? A few. This exact one? For people who haven't seen or heard about a video like this before, about half missed the gorilla. If you knew about the gorilla, you probably saw it. But did you notice the curtain changing color or the player on the black team leaving the game? Let's rewind and watch it again. <laughs> Here comes the gorilla, and there goes a player. The curtain is changing from red to gold. When you're looking for a gorilla, you often miss other unexpected events. And so <laughs> that's the importance of paying attention. I mean, you were looking right at the screen, and you missed everything changing in front of you, all right? And so one of the things we want to highlight is, is that hopefully you'll be paying attention um, as we go through the talk today. Now, as I mentioned, I, I'm trained as a cognitive psychologist. And so what we, we look at a lot, how we represent information. I mean, that's really what cognitive psychology is. Whether it's, you know, perceptual experiences. You know, you don't directly perceive anything. Your eyes collect light. Okay, it gets transduced into action potential sent up to the brain, and your brain basically takes those little pixels, essentially, and builds a representation of what's there. So we're in a classroom, there's a jackhammer outside, okay, and you're building that representation as it goes. Now, you, while you, I'm sure many of you know quite a bit about cognitive psychology and learning and memory, you're doing the same thing, okay? But what the learning design process involves is taking content and representing it in a medium, okay? Like we have over here on the computer, all right? And so what we hope is that you can match up the way that information is presented in this medium with how our brain is representing the information, okay? Now what we're going to do, and I, I apologize this graphic isn't the best resolution, okay? But we're gonna look at various aspects of how memory works and try to map that onto the design process give you some tools that can help to you know, interact with faculty and think and get them to think about all right, the ways that they can use our knowledge of learning. Now, I will say cognitive psychologists, when we look at learning, we really look at memory, okay? Um, learning really comes out of the educational psychology, but there's a lot of overlap between them, okay? And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna, we're gonna focus on a couple of aspects of processing in the brain, all right? We're gonna look at working memory or short-term memory. Those terms are used interchangeably, okay? How we map that on to our long-term knowledge, all right? And then we're going to see, well, how can we incorporate the way that our memory works into the design process, all right? The way that we present the information. And we have a computer screen here, but really this applies to any medium, whether it's in the classroom, Okay, or online. Now, one of the things that we know about cognitive psychology, about processing that we have, is that we have a very limited capacity for processing information. Now, we essentially have unlimited storage. I mean, as far as we know, no human has ever filled up their brain. Okay, you may think that you have, okay, but we don't have any record of that ever happening. But in terms of processing information, your experience, we have very limited capabilities. And I'll try to highlight that. What are we going to do? Name the days of the week out loud and in order as fast as you can. All right. Very easy, right? All right, very easy. Now, let's make it a little more difficult. Do it again, this time in alphabetical order. Y'all gave up already? <laughs> All right. Let me help you out. Is it a lot easier now? Much, much easier. All right. Now, the reason is, when I had you name them in alphabetical order, there's seven days. Okay? That's far beyond your capacity to process information. Okay? And so what you end up doing 
is you end up going, okay, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Friday, Friday, that's eh, Friday's first, okay, so I'll put that in the first slot. Then you go back again. In fact, how many of you just gave up? You didn't even try. <laughs> okay, yeah, I'm, 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 I expect many of you. The reason is, we call this cognitive load. Whenever we're, you know, experiencing anything, there's a certain amount of what we call cognitive load inherent in the task. Okay? So there's a cognitive load for you listening to me watching the screen. Okay? You're watching your YouTube videos okay? or some show on TV. There's a cognitive load associated with that, and that can go up and down. What we know about learning is that if the cognitive load of a task exceeds what the processing capabilities are, learning breaks down. Okay? It will break down to the point where you may just completely give up. So how can we use this? All right. Well, one of the things that we can do, and, and we're going to talk in a second about cognitive load theory, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. We can provide a scaffolding like this to help reduce the amount of load that's inherent in task, inherent in the learning process. Because once that cognitive load of a task gets beyond what our capabilities are, Okay? We shut down. And students, unless they're highly, highly motivated, okay? unless they're highly motivated, they're going to give up. All right? They don't care. Now, you're going to get some motivated students that will push through and they'll go back and they'll do it again and again and again until they get it. But a lot of students are going to give up. So what we have to do is we have to design the way that we present the content in a way to try to limit the cognitive load. Now, we'll do another example. Right, I, I, I'm big on what I call experiential learning. Right? You remember a lot better if you experience it yourself. So what I want you to do, I want you to remember right, these letters. NAS, AFB, INS, ACN, NPA. Anybody get them? Nobody? Let's try it again. Same letter, same order. Now how many got them? What were they? NASA? FBI? FBI? Don't say that out loud. I'm going to start looking. <laughs> CNN, PA, right? Much, much, much easier this time. Okay? The reason is we've reduced the cognitive load. We've taken those 15 letters all right, that are well beyond our capacity. Our capacity to process information is really limited to about three to four items at a time. And depending on the task, it might be as low as two. Okay. So what we have to do is we have to be able to design the content to fit within those processing capabilities that we have. All right. So this gets us to cognitive load theory. How many people are familiar with cognitive load theory? All right, good, I'm, I'm glad. All right. So what we do, what cognitive load theory says is that we look at everything that's involved in the task. Okay. Is there a laser pointer on here? No. If we start at the top, intrinsic load, this is the cognitive load that's inherent in the task itself, okay? Now, we oftentimes think, and I've done some readings, that you can't really change the intrinsic load of a task. Well, th there are some tricks that you can do that we'll get to a bit later. There are some tricks that you can do that can help you to manage the intrinsic load, but this is the difficulty that's inherent in the task. So two plus two, right, is much different than solving differential equations, okay? So the intrinsic load, though, really is dependent on the content. There are some things we can do, okay? But what we can really work on is extraneous load and germane load. Now, the extraneous load, that's the way the presentation or the, the content is presented. And this is what look, learning specialists, this is what they work on, okay? When we talk about reducing extraneous load, right, learners, they only have a limited capacity to process information. If they are using any of that capacity to access the information, that's taking capacity away 
from learning the content. So you want to reduce this as much as possible. For example, okay, you want to describe a triangle. I can sit up here and describe what a triangle is. It's got three sides, they all connect, internal angles out of 280. Or I can show a picture of a triangle. Right? That picture represents everything I just said with a much lower extraneous load. Now the germane load, okay, this is the one that we really need to focus on. This is the way that we can match up this information that's coming in with existing knowledge that we have. All the knowledge that we have is built upon previous knowledge. What we want learners to do is to take this content that we're delivering to them and match it up with what they already know. That's what the goal of the learning process is. And if they can match that up, they can then get that into long-term memory. They can use it later in life, okay? They can use it later in their courses. So what we really want to focus on is capitalizing on this germane load, this ability to connect with previous information. Now this previous knowledge that we have, okay, we call that schemas. And we're gonna to get to there in just a second. But this brings us to our first point, all right? When we, when we look at cognitive load, okay, you know, it, it's based on these three factors added up. If the cognitive load exceeds processing capabilities, learning will break down, okay? Now this is particularly important when we have content or tasks that involve high intrinsic load. And this happens, okay, in every course, all right? So one of the things that you can do, and I'll turn it over to Kathy, is the question that you can ask. All right. And, and Josh, I, I don't want to be a pest, but we have to watch our time. Ah, so got just it. Just a little forewarning. Oh, yeah. All <laughs> so right. um, <laughs> <laughs> often as instructional designers, one of the key things we do is just ask questions and help people think about what matters. I also want to warn you, the operative word in that question is not the number five. I'm married to a faculty member, and I was just running these questions by him last night, and he goes, five? Where'd that come from? Why do I need to worry about five big concepts? It's like, oh, brother. So just, you know, that's so irrelevant. But it's important that we ask, you know, how are things connected so that we help faculty start to deal with these schema, these cognitive loads. The difficult concepts will take more time. Every, everybody who's taught a while, you start to hone right in on they can't do this, or this is where they struggle. And so you want to identify that. And often, when they're struggling with it, some of it has to do with they just have misconceptions. As we know, those are really stuck in their minds, too. So that's one thing that you really want to get people thinking about, the big questions, how it connects, so that they avoid the plague of content coverage. That con you know, getting through the content just to get through it is really deadly. I knew a faculty who cut out 40% of his content by making it a more active class, students performed so much better. And so we really have to think about, you know, the difficulty, how it connects, and the schema. Yeah, and that's a great point. Five is completely irrelevant, okay? But faculty know where the most difficult points are, all right? They know that. And they probably have some tools that can help to reduce the cognitive load. Now, we do have to move a little quickly, so we're gonna go through this demonstration relatively quickly. I wanna show you, like this germane load, it's based on schemas. Schemas is the way that we represent knowledge, all right? They're built on experiences. All of your knowledge is essentially stored in schemas. It starts off when you're young, okay? You're crawling around on the ground, everything goes in your mouth, right? You have kids, you've seen this, right? The schema that those kids have, the way they explain the world are things that taste good and things that don't, right? That's it, and they build on those until they know the difference between cats and dogs. Okay, up to where we have schemas for things like love, for processes, like what it's like to go to a restaurant. Now, what I want, what we're gonna try to do here, I'm gonna try to show you the importance of schemas, okay? We're gonna break you up into three. One, two, and three, all right? I want you guys on the left, on my right, to keep your eyes open, everyone else close their eyes. I'm gonna show you a picture, okay? And I just want you to look at the picture quick. All right, everybody's got it. All right, now you close your eyes, the middle group, open your eyes, okay? I want you to look at this picture and study. All right, now close your eyes. And then cheating over here. Now the group over here on the right side of the room, open your eyes, all right? 
Now, what we're going to do, everybody can open their eyes again. Okay? I'll read you a little story. If the balloons popped, the sound wouldn't be able to carry since everything would be too far away from the correct floor. A closed window would also prevent the sound from carrying since most buildings tend to be well insulated. Since the whole operation depends on a steady flow of electricity, a break in the middle of the wire would also cause problems. Of course, the fellow could shout, but the human voice is not loud enough to carry that far. An additional problem is that a string could break on the instrument. Then there could be no accompaniment to the music message. It's clear that the best situation would involve less distance. Then there would be fewer potential problems. With face-to-face -face contact, the least number of things could go wrong. Make sense? Oh, does this make sense? Raise your hand if it makes sense. What, what are you guys doing over here? <laughs> I, I knew you guys were the smart ones, right? <laughs> the reason is, I put a schema in your mind. Here's the pictures that were shown. All right? Now, you guys over here, you guys really got screwed, okay? <laughs> there was nothing there to help you out, okay? The group in the middle, this is exactly what that paragraph was describing. I gave you a schema that you could put those pieces of information in, and it makes sense, okay? Over here, the pieces are there, but they're not in the correct order, all right? So it's a little more challenging. I mean, how many of you have received some content from a faculty that was like that paragraph that was there, okay? <laughs> If that's the case, okay, if you're not understanding it, how, can, how are the students going to understand it? You know, we have to match up the content with schemas that they have. All right? Now, this is going to depend a lot on you know, the nature of the course, introductory courses. Okay? They often come in, the students, the learners, with no knowledge. We have to build those schemas for them. Now, they're going to have past experiences that they must build upon. That's how learning takes place. In more advanced courses, there's often prerequisites. So you expect students to have some knowledge, some prerequisite knowledge. Okay, and these are schemas, is what they are. Okay? The problem is, there's such variability in the amount of prerequisite knowledge that students come in with. Okay? So what instructional designers have to do, now, faculty, okay, the content area experts, they have hundreds upon thousands of schemas for their content area. They know that, okay? They assume that what they put down, a student with no knowledge is going to be able to figure out. But you have to be able to lead them down that path, okay? And so what you have to do is to make connections, and we'll talk about this in just a second. But even having a schema, all right, might not be enough, all right? And, 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 and this study where this came from, they actually looked at memory. That's how they designed the studies. They looked at memory. The people that were given the schema remembered well over twice as much as those that were given a partial schema or nothing. All right? Having the appropriate schema in place when you present the content is critical for learning to occur. But having the schema might not be enough. So the procedure is actually quite simple. First, you arrange things into different groups. Of course, one pile may be sufficient, depending on how much there is to do. If you have to go somewhere else to the lack of facilities, that's the next step. Otherwise, you're pretty well set. It's important not to overdo things. That is, it's better to do too few things at once than too many. In the short run, this may not seem important, but complications can easily arise. A mistake can be expensive as well. Soon, however, it will become just another facet of life. It's difficult to foresee any end to the necessity for this task in the immediate future, but then one can never tell. After the procedure is completed, one arranges the materials into different groups again. They can then be put into their appropriate places. Eventually, they'll be used once more, and the whole cycle will then have to be repeated. However, that's just a part of life. How many people know what this is? One? Laundry, right? Now, hopeful, I hope, I hope you all have a schema for laundry, about what laundry is and what it involves, okay? I hope. But you have it, yet you still couldn't use it here. Why? Because it wasn't activated, okay? So what we have to do when we're designing content is not only make sure the schemas are there, but make sure they're active when the students or when the learners need them, okay? And it's critical for the learning process to take place. Now, Schemas, the idea of this content knowledge that we have. This is really what the germane load is talking about. Okay? Is the instructional design process, the content design, is that facilitating acquisition of schemas, um, activation of schemas? Okay? 
And it's critical to the learning process to have that there. My turn. So we're looking at how do you connect it so that students are activating their schemas, but you really have to think about what's significant and helping them find meaning in it so that it's just not isolated facts. A lot of um, students will remember things. If you look at um, visuals of how they remember things are in a concept map, they're not connected. And what we really want to do is help them make connections. So when you're working with faculty, you might ask them, you know, what are the connections? How can you make this go through a lesson? Worked with one faculty one time, designed a course, and then he went and asked other professors, and we put it on little videos where someone would say, now when you take ME302, you'll be using free body diagrams that do such and such. So right there, making the connections and making them so they would see this is how it's all going to come together. Yeah. No, and, and, and that's a really important aspect of it. I mean, you can do this at a course level. You can do it on you know, kind of an assignment level at a program level. I mean, you're building these schemas, and you want to reactivate them as much as you can. Because the way our long-term memory is stored is it's stored in this kind of web. Things that are associated are, are, are stored together. All right? And so as you bring this up in the design process, faculty and you need to look for places where we can make connections with earlier material, where we can preview the future. Okay? Because that's what's going to strengthen all those schemas, make that and, and make learning happen. Now, this is a modification somewhat of uh, what I do in the classroom. All right? First day class, especially my introductory class, I always ask this to my students. What is, which of the following is the most important ingredient for successful learning? So the intention and desire to learn, paying close attention to the material, learning in a way that matches your personal learning style, the amount of time you spend studying or learning, what you think about while studying or learning. All right. Now, it's a somewhat loaded question. There, some of these are important, okay? but there is really one on here that really is the most important. I'm going to ask you. All right, with a show of hand. One, two, three, four, five. Okay? On the count of three, we're all going to put them up. And you're going to put one, two, three, four, five. Give me a second to think about it. I can see, I can see the gears turning. <laughs> all right, ready? One, two, three. Let's see fours, ones, threes, ones, fives, threes, a lot of ones. I mean, it's a mix, all right? Now, I want to point out right away, number three, learning styles. There really isn't any evidence that learning styles translate into any measurable um, academic improvements. Now, there are some things that maybe lend themselves to visual presentation better than auditory, but to try to match up a student's learning style with presentation of information, there's not a lot of evidence suggesting that works. Throw that one out the window, all right? <laughs> and I hope I didn't crush anybody's whole uh, way of going about the design process. <laughs> all right? There really isn't very much evidence, if any, that this, the learning styles really matter, okay? Which one is it? It's number five, all right? What you think about while you study, all right? or while, they're, while learning is happening. Now, we have until 10.10, right? It, I had a demo to do, and there's no way we have time for it, okay? But it, it basically shows how important it is. I mean, what I was gonna do is give everybody um, sheets of paper with different instructions, okay? One of you were gonna rate the pleasantness of words I was gonna read off. The other one was gonna check whether there were E's or G's in the words. And what you find, the people that rate the pleasantness of the words as I read them, okay? will remember way more, all right? When I do this in class, I have everybody stand up, okay? Pretty much everybody in the EG checking, where all they have to do is think about the spelling of the words, is sitting down, okay, I just, I start, how many remember 10 words, 11 words, 12 words? Everybody in the EG checking group is sitting down while almost everybody in the group rating the pleasantness is standing up, okay? The important part of learning is how the individual is processing the information, how the learner is using that to connect that information with previous knowledge. Okay? Now, where this comes from is a word from a while ago by guys named Craig and Lockhart, looking at levels of processing. Okay? 
And what they would do is essentially tasks like that, where they would have people count how many letters there were, was it written in capital letters, versus does the word rhyme with this, okay? Versus, you know, would this word fit in a sentence? And they looked at the different ways that people were encoding information, right? And they found that if you processed originally the information at a deeper level, you thought about the semantics, you related it to yourself, you experienced something, memory was much better, and in some cases, six times as high as processing at a shallow level. So what does that mean for the design process? You really have to think about how the learner is interacting with the material, okay? One of the things that we know is, it's kind of this idea of active processing, okay? Now, a lot of times in the classroom when I teach, I'm up there lecturing, the students are listening while they're actually, they're checking Facebook, they're doing online shopping, okay? And they're not really thinking about the material, okay? But what you need to do is you need to get them to process it. I mean, I can ask you, how many Seinfeld fans are there? Do you remember Keith Hernandez? Yes, and yeah, in fact, all right? Now think back to the first time you learned about working memory. Remember anything about that experience? Probably not, because it was in a lecture. Okay, maybe you read it in a book. All right? But watching Seinfeld, it evo it's an experience, okay? It makes you laugh, it makes you cry, okay? There's emotion tied to it. So what you need to do in the design process is find ways to get the learners to interact with and actively process the information, okay? It can be as simple as just adding a YouTube clip, you know, popular media, okay? You know, TV shows, movies, all right? Those are the things that students remember. Okay, in fact, I've, I've had students, I teach the introductory psychology class, and I teach one of the um, research methods that they take much later, okay? All the students say, oh, I took your intro, intro class and I really liked it, and I'm like, what do you remember, okay? They remember the demos and the videos that we did, right? That's what they remember. Now, when I probe them a little bit, they can come up with the topics we talked about around those, okay? But it's because they were actively processing the information. Okay? That's what led to the stronger memory. So when we think about the deeper learning, it's really just getting students to understanding. As we know, memory is just the residue of thought. If we think about it, we'll remember it. And so we want our students to be thinking about things and applying it. And so a lot of this has to do with we're asking how we're asking students to process the material. It's not only what we're doing in class. Do we have an active classroom? Are we showing them things? Are we getting them to do? But it's a lot about assessment. Do we ask them to do performance-based assessment? Do we ask them to do things that really require thinking? So as we can go through a lot of activities, I think, that really don't prompt deeper thinking. And so you've got to be pretty particular about it. And you can come up with some ways that I really think promote a lot of deeper thinking. The shallow learning, sometimes it is necessary. There are some things you just have to know. I mean, facts are important, but you probably don't have to spend a lot of time teaching those. And, and one of the things that you can do along these lines is you don't have to have your assessments get to this. You can just throw something in the content like, how is this related to this? Just pose the question there, okay? Students will read that and they'll think about it. That's what you want them to do, okay? They don't have to write out an answer and get it checked. In fact, there was a study that was done where it, it's unpublished results. Um, I'm not really sure why it was unpublished. I, I, I don't know the author directly. It was secondhand I heard this story. Where they had people, after reading, they just submitted three questions, deep questions, that, you know, as, as deep as they could about the reading. They submitted them, that was it. They didn't answer them, nobody checked them, okay? The students that just wrote those three questions performed significantly better than the ones that didn't. Just writing the questions. Okay? Force them to think about the material at a deeper level. And a that was a colleague of Stephen Chu. Stephen Chu, Chu as, as some of you know, Stephen Chu as a colleague has done in um, Alabama. All right. Now along those same lines, kind of getting at practice and stuff, there's, there's an effect, relatively recent, um, called the testing effect. Some of you may or may not be aware of this. All right. When you're designing a course, one of the easiest ways that you can promote learning is to include multiple tests. It doesn't have to be necessarily multiple choice, okay? Okay? There are studies that were done where they would give people new information. They would have them study, everyone studied it once, okay? Some people would study it a second time. Other people would take a test on it, okay? Same amount, they experienced the material the same amount of time. The people that were tested on it 
one week later, remembered significantly more. And this has been repeated. This is the original study that really looked at this. It's been around for a long time, actually since the late 1800s, early 1900s. Okay? But it's really been more recent that people have started to look at this in the classroom. And consistently, time after time again, by repeated testing, what you're doing is you're getting the learners to practice retrieval. Okay, we know practice makes perfect. Through repeated testing, okay, what they're doing is they're practicing, pulling that information from long-term memory and using it. In my intro to psychology class this semester, okay, I took the test bank from the publishers, right, created some practice tests. I didn't put any effort into it at all. Right? Now, I just gave students, students could select whether or not to do it. Okay, I didn't randomly assign them. That's the next step. Right? The ones that did it did much better on the exams. I mean, it, it, it was amazing. It was the best predictor, actually, even better than coming to class. All right? The repeated testing helps because it practices um, the process of retrieval. And so, As we know, not all practice is not equal. I know that for sure because I'm learning to play the violin. <laughs> Fortunately, I didn't have to demonstrate that in here. I, I freak out at the re recitals. It's me and a bunch of five-year-olds, and I'm <laughs> shaking away. But anyway, back to practice. Um, so the type of practice they do is really important. You can do all kinds of things. Like I know some faculty now who have students do homework, and they don't turn it in. They get test on the homework. It's a practice, but they're getting the testing effect. Um, there's lots of practice we can do, but it has to be very targeted. I feel kind of funny saying this, but it has to be goal-oriented. Think about the type of practice. Does it match what you really want them to be able to do? Very important. And we have to consider the feedback aspect. Josh, you teach classes of 300 plus. So how can you give the feedback they need? There's a lot of um, information on feedback. Not all feedback has to be instantaneous. There's sometimes it's better for learners to just work on things and figure it out themselves. So you have to think about all this as you're integrating practice into instruction. And we have one minute or something. Yes, I so. know. We're, we're basically out of time. We're going to try to bring it all together. So here is the image we saw earlier, OK, with the working memory, the long-term web. These are things that you know what you can work on as designers. So when we look at the computer here, all right, what you want to try to do is reduce the cognitive load. Less is more, all right, as much as possible. All right? With working memory, you want to have active processing. Think about the material, because that's going to associate it with the schemas they have. All right? The content has to activate those schemas. Okay? Or you have to create the schemas for the learners. And then practice okay, is going to help with both of these. And we are out of time, so thank you. <laughs>